it is 6 30. Sorry. Oh, you can hear me. Yeah. Now you can't hear me. Good. Um, so we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order because we've got lots to do this evening. Um, the first order of business always is public comment. And um, quick reminder that especially in this um, budget season, we are uh, we have a second public comment following the um, presentation of, or, of the latest budget numbers. So you're welcome to speak now or after we see that. Um, I would encourage you if you have public comment that is not budget related, now would be a good time to, to share it. Um, and if you wanna wait until after the budget presentation, you're certainly welcome to. With that, is there anyone in the room or online who would like to offer public comment? Being no one in the room, I'll call, I see one hand raised online from Timothy's iPhone. If you can go ahead and take yourself off mute and introduce yourself for the audience. Hello, it's Tim Sinnett. Um, thank you all. And this is actually budget related. Um, I wanted to say thank you for the FAQ that's up online, it's super helpful. Um, I was a little bit concerned about, <clears throat> sorry, um, two things. Well, two comments in, in the FAQ. Uh, one of them says, if a school receives the merger grant, their schools do not qualify for any of the new weighted categories for having a small school. And then another comment further down says, it was not apparent that Roxbury, one of the smallest schools in the state, would not qualify for the small school weight because of the past merger. Um, I just want to make a comment that I feel like that is a major flaw in the law. Um, I think it's deeply unfortunate. I feel like it puts the two laws kind of counter to each other. And that the um, new law that's in place is going to really push back against and maybe even mm, do damage to the previous law that uh, went through and that we were a part of. And that's it for my time. Thank you all. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, Tim. And just as a reminder for everybody, the board um, really appreciates public comment and takes it in. It's our practice uh, not to respond back um, to public comments because the, the whole purpose of public comment is for us to hear from the community and use what we hear to um, in our thinking and in our decision making, which in some cases, although it's probably not germane tonight, um, the public comment we hear doesn't necessarily address something that's on the agenda. Um, but then even if it does, um, we can weigh those thoughts and those comments in when we do our deliberations, but don't necessarily respond or it's our practice not to respond in the moment. <clears throat> and I think with that, we can close public comment for now and move on to the consent agenda. And um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move to pass the consent agenda. Second. Second. Any discussion or questions about it? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And just a brief bit of context for those following along at home, the consent agenda is a bundle of things that are generally not very um, uh, contentious <laughs> and pretty um, typical to board work. So we just bundle them all together and take care of them. But if there is something for discussion, any board member can pull one out, an item out for discussion, which we didn't need to do tonight. So moving right along to our first order of board business, we'd like to invite Jody Emerson of the um, Central Vermont Career Center to come up and present on your Fabulous school and district. Yes. Thank you. Hold on one second, Jody. Can you um, little or uh, minimize the squares on the side? Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Jody. Hi, Jody. Hi. Welcome. It's my. You guys get. The first go of this, I think that happened last year too. Um, so every December, the Central Vermont Career Center is working on our budget just like you are. And we have the opportunity to visit all of the sending school boards and make this presentation. 
So this is like hot off the presses today, literally, because uh, the finance committee met last night and our full board won't see this until Monday. So you're actually in advance of our the CVCC uh, SD board. So this will be helpful for when I'm ready for that. Good practice. Yeah. Every photo in here is of our students this year. So you might recognize some students in here. That's one of my favorite parts about sharing what happens at the Central Vermont Career Center, where you do send students along with five other sending schools um, in our region. And then some students from outside our region do access as well. And so we get the opportunity to prepare students for a variety of careers in like really intensive programming that's four hours every day. So they come to us, they grab breakfast on their way in this year. At 8.30, they're in their program and they're with that program instructor until 12.30 each day. And then some of them with licenses leave and some of them stay and go get lunch in the Spalding cafeteria and then climb onto the bus and come on back here each day. Um, this year, we actually have board goals. Last year when we came, we hadn't done that yet. We hadn't done the work for that. So it's really great to be able to share those for the first time. Um, the first one is around long-term planning and the best news for us and for our programming is the plan for a state-of-the-art career center in 2028, so fall of 2028. That's not in this year's budget though, so, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're looking at, um, last year we had 408 applicants for our programs and we took 208, um, so 200 students who wanted access didn't get it. And that's that's been really hard. And each year we've seen our applicants grow, the number of applicants we have, and each, so thus each year we're turning away more students than we have before. And it's really hard to do that, um, knowing that they all deserve an opportunity to, to do that hands-on work. We also want, we have a program quality committee and they're working to provide equitable, safe, rigorous programming and just make sure that we're more inclusive in our curriculum and instruction. We also have an equity scholar in residence this year who's been an amazing asset to our staff especially and has also been teaching some citizenship related work in each program and talking about OSHA history and in connection with Barry history, a lot of the the OSHA rules actually came out of Barry, which is not really a surprise with the granite industry there. And then we're, as I think most boards are, except maybe at budget season, we're looking at ways to engage our community. And of course our community is 18 towns. So it's really hard to get our information out to everyone and to also gather information and feedback back. We rarely have folks at our board meetings and Orca has been there this year, and maybe that's get, reaching a few more folks, but it, it feels like there's a lot of work to do to get the community more involved. So some of the charges that I've been given this year as a result of these goals is to develop and implement a full day educational program that, that meets the needs of our students in conjunction with that new center. Um, we, we did really look at, can we go to full day with academics next year? And that would have been a 25.8% increase on our budget. And, and knowing what all of you are already struggling with, to put that on top of what you're already trying to deal with in your budgets, didn't seem appropriate or fair. We've also concerned about being able to find licensed teachers to fill those positions. And what does it do if we're, we're taking them away from some of our sending schools, for example? And then we're continuing always to try to enhance the skills for our students to be ready for the workforce wherever they're going. So the reasons I've already sort of addressed this, that we don't wanna keep turning away students, but we don't have the space. Last year, you may have heard, we tried to open a welding program in a partnership with an industry in Barrie. And because the space that they had available to us was too small, we were not given that permission from the state. So we're seeking actively that space for next year. We have applicants for welding next year and we have a, a teacher who's in the interview process. So we may be able to hire them um, in January to start building that program for us. So we're really excited about that. And we're, we're just looking for ways to be creative and meet the needs of more people. 
I included the mission statement that we have here for the Career Center. It's been one that has been around for a long time and I inherited it. This is my third year there. Um, and I love our tagline, Education That Works. It's so much fun to see that everywhere. I have with me um, both our program of studies. I have several copies. Um, and last year's annual report, because our current one's in draft process. So for anyone who wants those, I will put those copies with Jill for you. Um, this is actually a lot of this slideshow from here forward is very similar to last year. We just made a copy and then updated some of the numbers. And there's actually a couple slides that aren't updated yet because the information isn't in for us yet. So this is talking about what do we look at when we're making a budget? And it's the same thing that your board looks at. And as far as resources, what do you have for qualified staff? What do you, what are you com coming out of negotiations with? What do you need for supplies? What what is best going to support the students? For us, how much is it going to cost to have OSHA training? Because in the past, we had someone who did that training on site who was one of our staff, and that person retired. So then we had to kind of contract out for that. What does it look like if one of our staff leaves and we need to fill that position and and maybe can't find a qualified applicant, as we happened with plumbing and heating last year? So we we hired one of our permanent subs to as an emergency teacher license, but they didn't have the plumbing and heating background. So we contracted with BHB to get someone who did have that. And that partnership has lasted through this year and has been phenomenal. Every student in plumbing and heating that took the apprenticeship exam passed the apprenticeship exam last year. So very exciting. And, and the partnership with BHB has been wonderful. So um, the board set these parameters in November when we met. Um, so they asked us to continue thinking forward to what does it look like for FY29 if we have that new building and we are full day with academics, what does it take to build up to that so that we successfully are ready for that? They wanted us to explore opportunities for collaboration across our sending schools. Are there places, are there things that you have that we can, that are pipelines to us, but also things that we can work a little more collaboratively to support so that we have students that maybe can access a program here if they can't come to us or somewhere else. And those are things that we need to discuss. And it's also part of the comprehensive local needs assessment, um, which we do every two years for our Perkins funding. They wanted to think about what the programming a little differently. So this year we did, um, I'm gonna forget what we call it, but a program analysis and basically figured out how many students do we need to break even in that. And sometimes the break-even costs of programming like automotive or welding, for example, needs more students than we can actually legally have in the program for numbers based on um, state law. And so other programming like digital media arts or exploratory where we can have more students because it's not as dangerous and then there's not as high cost of equipment, those are the areas where we can kind of offset those more expensive programs. And so looking at the configuration and figuring out ways to make sure that we can sort of offset that. And the, the board was really generous and said that we could increase between 16 and 18%, but not 25.8%, which is my wish list. These are very similar to last year that like, we're looking at our class sizes, where are things going well, where, is, where are we struggling? We know we don't have enough space at Spalding High School. And so where can we expand? Where can we hold that welding program? Um, what, what do we need to do to build that facility? We have, as you know, we have a base funding rate and then we take a percentage of that and throw it into a really complicated formula to figure out our tuition. Um, and we just got word last Friday that it might be 13,063, maybe. I think that came through at like four o'clock on Friday. Always does. <laughs> <laughs> so our updated numbers are a result of that um, a little bit. So that did help our, our uh, percentage increase. You all know that the health insurance benefits are going up quite substantially. We have liability insurances that are increased. Um, negotiated contract may increase quite a bit. So a variety of things that just cost more than they always have. And of course, we're buying lumber, which costs more and and tools that cost more than they used to. So we do anticipate some salary increases. Um, we're hopeful that we're going to have a negotiated agreement soon, but we do not have that yet. Um, 
other things that we've already talked about in there. Our FTEs have steadily increased, but we're at the point now where they're gonna reach our capacity and level out. So even though we've seen that increase that we've been able to apply and kind of help cut down the total cost of tuition, we're, we're getting to the point where they're gonna flatline. This one is just the enrollment that we've had um, in the last two years. And you'll notice that there's different headcounts, sometimes over the amount of what we actually have in the program. And that's because of co-op students who are out working and they're in the program one day a week. We um, co-op is running a little different this year in that it's happening across different days. So students are in our center at different days instead of all together in the same day. And they're, um, instructor of record is their program instructor. So it might be the automotive teacher, it might be the electrical teacher. Uh, it is not the co-op coordinator. He coordinates, but does not have the right to grade students. And so the, the program instructors really need to see the students. One thing you might notice on there is that our design and fabrication program, which was brand new in 20, FY23, had two students last year, or yeah, it says three, but we only had two students complete the program last year. We have five students in it now. We have no applicants in our first round, unfortunately. And we have over 200 applicants already for first round applications that open November 16th and close December 22nd. I did tell you already that we have welding applicants. We have well over 20 applicants for welding. So we're probably gonna swap those programs. This slide has not changed um, from last year because I only have projected tuition from four other centers right now. So the two I have at the top, um, Patricia Hannaford looks like they're gonna be right around 30,000 in their tuition. Southwest is gonna be about 27,000. Um, Stafford Technical Center, which is right there in the middle is gonna be 21, just over 21,000. We're gonna be uh, just over 19,000. That's our projection right now, based on the numbers we have. And Riverbend is uh, just under 18,000. So those are the only ones that I have for next year. But the the chart, I expect to, to be about the same, that we're gonna be in the same location on that comparatively to other tech centers. So our anticipated tuition is 19,423. If we put it through that whole complicated formula, some of that comes directly to us, the on behalf payment from the state, and then we bill the remaining tuition to the school district. So it would be 8,058 per FTE, which is on that six semester average. And we anticipate that Montpelier's is a little over 26 FTEs next year. That's just a chart to kind of look at where, where are we spending the money? A lot of you probably do that in your budget presentations as well. And thankfully, as in all of ours, it should, the majority of it should be going towards instruction and education. These are some of our revenue sources. And we also have Perkins funding a grant, um, which is about 250,000 each year that we get. Sometimes we um, are lucky enough to get some time grant funds. This year, we also got 24,000 in unexpected gear grant funds to uh, renovate a mobile home. And we're still waiting for that mobile home to show up from the state for our building trades program to work on and renovate. And then we'll sell it and hand the 24,000 if we make that much off of it back to the state and put the rest into our building trades program. So I think that's everything. Jill, did I miss anything? <laughs> Can you just explain, Jody, because I think we have some new board members since the last time you presented on the budget, how it works with ballot language and things like that? Um, the, good question. I removed the ballot because it was last year's ballot and this year's is different. We um, basically, the budget goes out, do, do you approve the um, total amount for the Career Center? which is somewhere between four and 5 million total for our, our center. Um, and so it'll have that amount on there. And if the voter and everybody gets that all across all 18 towns, 
They also will vote for one at-large member this year. Washington Central's at-large member is up for renewal, even though they just got appointed last year by the electorate. Um, it was one year was left on that term that they were appointed to previously. So that person will be up for election. So we'll have two items, the, the amount of the budget, which if approved by our voters, all of the uh, ballots go together and they all travel to Barry and they all get counted together in Barry about a week after town meeting day because we give the town clerks time to pull that all together. Um, and if it is approved, then you are responsible for your share and it comes out of at that amount of your budget. And so we try to be very clear that this is not, this is what you're already anticipating this in your budget. Washington Central is anticipating it. Harwood is anticipating it. So it's not a, above and beyond the monies that you're already asking for in your budgets, but it's anticipated within and that their approval means that you're you're gonna pay your bill that you get from us. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 That, that last part seems really key for everybody to understand that even though we would be voting on it, that specific budget separate from the school district budget, yeah, it doesn't mean that then there is another cost. cost. Right. It is already included in our right. school district budget. Right. What it does mean, though, is if mine passes and one of my setting schools doesn't, they're still liable for that amount in there. So they the cuts have to come somewhere else. They can't say, yeah. oh, we're just not going to pay the career center. Good point. Yeah. Yep. Do members of the board have other questions for Jody? Um, I just need a clarification. So if the town votes not to pass that particular part of um, the voting um, pieces, what then the kids can still go to the center, but the town has to come up with the money. We won't budget, actually know. The school budget has to come up. With we money. won't actually know if they, if a specific town, because they're commingled. So we have no idea what town supported or didn't support the career center. We just get the overall tally from the 18 towns. Okay. Those votes are all commingled. Then what happens if it doesn't pass? It We have to go back out just like you would have to, to okay. all 18 towns. Yeah. And it was very intentional to have them be commingled. So it wasn't, well, these three towns passed it and these three didn't. It, the whole idea is it's one district, 18 towns. We vote as one. Um, did Act 127 have an effect on you guys? Didn't that, or... No, our, our funding is coming up for discussion this legislative season. Um, we have this really complicated six semester average formula and there's literally a spreadsheet worksheet that we punch numbers into and put all of our, how much does each of the, there was a slide that talked about where we get reimbursements, how much did that get re reimbursed, how much is on behalf and all these things. And then it spits out a number at the bottom that tells us, here's what your tuition amount is. Our tuition is 9.7% higher than last year and um, how much is the remaining after the on behalf. So the, it's a complicated formula. The hope I think out of the APA study from last year and the work that's being done across many groups to try to advocate for a different funding for CTE is some direct payment for the students we have. Because right now I have more students that I'm getting funding for. So it it's spread out more. If I had direct funding for every single student I had, that tuition could be lowered a little bit. Um, the hope is that that would come directly off the top sort of thing. And I guess there was some research done in before COVID 2019, where it was 3% of education funding with CTEs. I'm sure it's up a little bit now, but everybody's is up. So it may still be a 3% of that funding is CTE. And so there's going to be a lot of work done this year as a result of that study. And the legislature is kind of primed for it to see if they're going to fund us differently. But it doesn't, the Act 127 doesn't impact us, except that it impacts all of you, which impacts us, if that makes sense. Does anyone want annual reports or program of studies? Can I ask a quick question about the 
do you want do you have an idea maybe statewide or or at least our towns the number i guess you told us the number but the percentage of students who take who are able to take advantage of cte by state or by just by us That's i mean question. i could figure it out if i did the math because he told us how yeah. many we have i'm curious yeah, more broadly students total to start this year we're, we're down a little bit from that um i don't know how many high school students there are yeah and I would say I look at 10 through 11, 10 through 12 grade, not, yeah. we do have three ninth graders, I think this year, but in general, we don't. Libby, do you know statewide? Do you ask that? It's probably on the AOE site. Off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Right here. Yeah. Jody, I have, I think what's an, is an obvious question. The, when you say the 19,000, that is essentially the full cost of educating one student Correct. in the, at the career center, but then the 8,000 per student, that's that $11,000 difference is because it's made up by those other sources of funding. Some is that right? It's made up by that. Some of it is, we get some of the funding for those students directly. And then I think the remainder of whatever your tuition is goes to you. And then we take the rest of what ours would be. Right. So if your tuition is at 22,000, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it's planning to be. Um, and ours is 19 and there's a little bit of money that you would hold on. But we also, it depends also because of that six semester average, I could have 30 of your kids and you could be paying for 26 or I could have 26 of your kids and you could be paying for 30 right. based on how it's been over the last three years. previous years. Correct. Yep. So Jason has some numbers from a few years ago. Um, he says 29, a few years ago, 29% of eligible high school students participated in CT across the straight state that was pre pandemic. So he doesn't have the numbers now. At that time, MHS was about 12% person yeah we've time for another question sure I'm, I'm curious about the the pressures you mentioned i'm i'm using my paraphrasing so it might be wrong um like the loss leaders right that there are programs that cost a lot more to run and there are programs that cost a lot less to run yeah and like within the within the industry of cte if there are pressures to like like, are there more students that are interested in those lower cost programs? And so that's a way to like prop up overall CTE or, yeah. I, I, Good question. Um, any program that started, we have to prove that it's high wage, high skill, high demand yeah. first. And the way that we do that is through the comprehensive lo local needs assessment. So last time we went through that was two years ago because we're just starting it this year. And what I got out of my process was that welding was number one. There's an uh, interest in diesel and auto body repair. And there's an interest in business, interestingly enough. Like, I think that we CTEs had it, then it went into high schools for a while. And now there's financial literacy, but not so much accounting and business stuff, um, depending on the high school. And so when we looked at that as a center and with that CLNA team, they identified, let's move forward with that welding and also design and fabrication was part of that because we thought putting together something that would benefit the granite sheds because they have lots of older folks that are in them that are ready to retire. COVID unfortunately caused a huge demand for granite and um, yeah, yeah, stones, yep. And um, so we thought we could build that for them and we also had a partnership planned with Norwich University. Um, and those things didn't happen the way that we expected out of that piece. But we went that way first and then thought we'd build up welding next. And so right now we're just gonna shift them. Um, although if the granite industry decides to step in and financially support, maybe there's a way to do both. I think we're, we're exploring industry support a lot more than we used to. Like, are there other ways to help fund these programs to support the workforce development? Yeah. 
said that there's an exploratory program. Can you yeah. say more about what that is? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> most of our programming is open to 11th and 12th graders. If we let in someone who's younger, we have to have state permission to do that and an explanation why. Otherwise, there's pre-tech courses. So you could have foundations, which some of the tech centers in Vermont have. Randolph Tech has one, um, which is for more for ninth graders, kind of get them familiarized with. And then 10th grade is more of an exploratory level. So students in our exploratory program have two instructors and um, they get some all four of the academics from those instructors, but they also have the opportunity to get introduced to every single program that we have. And so they'll do a week long kind of adventure where the students in those programs teach them something and they learn some of the tools of that trade. And then they will also shadow. So they've already started shadowing a different programs and we try to get those all in for them so they know what they wanna apply for next year. There is, um, there's been a pretty healthy trend of students that are in exploratory getting into other programs. Sometimes it can be a way to not get in because if you aren't following safety regulations or rules, it can be obvious to the instructors when you're shadowing in their program that uh, that student isn't listening to me, this might not be the space for them. Mm -hmm. But it is an opportunity for students to explore every single program that we have. Does that make it less likely that you would be denied entry into a program if you've been in the exploratory program? Is it kind of like a... It's on the year, it depends on the student. Early, yeah, right, gotcha. Yeah. Some of them, when they come in, they're, they're looking for an alternate mm -hmm. setting, right? So something that has something that's a little more engaging for them, but they may not really be invested in exploring all their programs. Some of them, I think it surprises them how, how exciting it is to go in and explore a program they didn't think they had any interest in. And we see, we see them come in and say, these are the programs I want to go into. And then by the end of the year, they're like, actually, I'd rather go into this one. That was way more fun. And I, I realized I really enjoy that. But at the same time, we have some students who are resistant to programs that they don't think they have an interest in. And that can set them up a little bit for, for failure as far as moving on. Yeah. I have a <clears throat> quick question. Um, I'm really grateful that this pathway exists for our students. Um, the traditional four-walled classroom doesn't work for many kids. And so the fact that you know we have this is such an asset. And, um, I feel like I think this is the third time I've seen you come before the board, and this is the third time you've said that we've had more demand than we have space for our programs, which I'm sure is kind of a heartbreaker for you all when there's so much demand. And I'm hearing about this FY29 state-of-the-art facility, and um, I'm curious about that and, and what that might look like and just sort of the development work and, and how, you know, at this point um, you see that possibly panning out. And then in the meantime, what's the plan, you know, in terms of like other options to kind of creatively, like I'm building partnerships to increase capacity. I'm just curious, like, wow, there's this kind of pie in the sky and this is where you'd like to get and like kind of knowing along the way how you can continue to, to build program to try to satisfy some of that demand for, for students. Yeah, um, you could help with that. <laughs> right. Any thinking that we can get on that would be great. But right now I've sort of tried to do some backwards design thinking about that. And my staff has helped a little bit with that as well. And so we're thinking it does make sense in some ways to open a foundations program. And what we see when we have students that are with us from 10th through 12th grade is that a steady improvement and steady growth in those skills, right? So the longer we have them, we are seeing improvements. I've heard my teachers say that. And so if we do open a foundations program, does that mean that we can split our exploratory um, and one of the things that I talked about last year was our new EMS2 program where students are working on their paramedic license, right, or certification. And so if we have a kid come in and we set the stage for them in foundations as a ninth grader, and that's where they want to go, and we had a health sciences exploratory after that, and then move them along that pathway, that might strengthen those pieces for them. We do, we are going to need to look at sites outside of our building. And we are thinking about right now, baking and culinary got, before I came, they got merged back together. They had been separate and baking had had a um, space on Main Street in Barrie and they were able to be open to the public sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that went away when they got kind of squished back together. Again, two teachers in a really small space where we can't accommodate the number of students that we should. And so we're, we're looking at spaces for that and how can we 
take those two programs back apart and provide more opportunity there. We are considering business. We're looking at um, our digital media arts program and does it make sense to have two layers or is there a way that we can shift some of that? And I think it is important to look at what do our sending schools have? How can we help build the pipelines from there? How can we, we, we collaborate? And I know that long before I even thought about working in CTE, that um, CBCC had pilot, like they had foundations programs in some of their Sunday schools. So they had one at Harwood, they had one at U32, and I think one other school. And so we can foot the bill, like pay the salary of someone and count those students potentially mm -hmm. and have a space at one of our sending schools. So there are a lot of things that we can explore that we just haven't had the capacity to do yet, but we need to. Thanks. Yeah. Do you have your own mechanisms for transportation? We have a bus without a driver. <laughs> we, do, I mean, mostly we rely on the study schools delivering the students to us and taking them back at the end of the day. We have a couple of vans, a truck and a short bus that we can use for field trips and for projects that we do, but we would need to work on that. Um, right now, we also partner with Community Rides because the students who are in design and fabrication are, their classroom is at the Granite Museum. And so they come to the center, they get their breakfast and then Community Rides drives them to the Granite Museum and then brings them back at the end of that day. So we are working on ways to, to meet those needs. And I think that's another area we could partner. It's also one of the, the um, things that we're hoping the legislature works on because right now equity for students in access doesn't exist if you can only come to me and I turn you away because I don't have enough seats. And the only way you can go to Randolph or to River Bend or to Essex is if you have the transportation. Right. And that's that's not equitable. And so I think that that uh, on the line calendar throughout the state for CTE and having a transportation system or plan statewide for CTE would benefit more students. Jim, Jim are on the plan to make sure to ask questions if they have them, but I don't see any. Thanks again, Jody. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much for Jody. joining us. Oh, well, oh, Miriam. Okay, great. No questions. Just because everyone's finished with their questions. I want to thank you and CBCC because I have a lot of classmates and just like people I know around the school who've gone to CBCC and it's just worked really well for them because for whatever reason, this building didn't work for them or that just worked better and especially with the concerns that we all have about getting a job that pays well enough it's just really awesome to see how well that works for people so thank you for everything cbcc does and i hope that you keep getting the support you need to run your program awesome thank you i'm glad your friends were feeling like it was the right fit for them <laughs> thank you Okay, our next order of business is the latest presentation on our budget and then a board discussion on what direction to go in. Uh, take it away, Libby. Okay. Oh. Okay, so just some um, reminders of where we've been. So the board and the community have seen this chart before. This is the FY24 comparison if Act 127 had been in place last year. Uh, for the fiscal budget that we are in now, <laughs> FY24. Uh, we do have some new numbers in here. So uh, the December 1st dollar yield number came in lower than uh, anticipated slightly. So the dollar yield uh, is recommended to be, keep in mind the dollar yield does not get voted on until May by the legislature. It's typically one of the last bills to be voted on. The dollar yield is anticipated to be 9,452. Last year, um, if 127 was in, in effect, the dollar yield would have been 9,687. So it is decreasing slightly um, from last year's kind of fakeish numbers to this year's more real numbers. 
The other number that is different on this slide is the equalized pupils. So Christina put in um, anticipated numbers. This is not a real number yet. We, have, we get the real number from the state and we have, although they said that they were going to send it to us yesterday, we did not get it yesterday, or at least I'm not aware of us getting it yesterday. So this is anticipated. It did, Christina is anticipating that number of equalized pupils to go up actually, because although our enrollment has dropped slightly, because the state is using a different way to qualify students and families as free and reduced lunch, um, our numbers actually went up across the board there. And of course that's a larger weight with the new waiting study. So that's the reason why that number went up by approximately 60 students. So that's good news. That's good news. That's Yay. Good news. <laughs> that would be bad news. 60. Yeah. Um, so uh, the rest is similar to what the board has seen before. Okay. It, it was it was minus 74 and now it's minus 14. No. Okay. No. The minus 74 was the, cal I'll remind you that it was the calculation uh, that the um, Brad James at the state, of, the agency of education did to show districts whether they'd be at an advantage or disadvantage district with the new weights. And what he did was he took the new, he took our old weights um, and then used some magical math that I could not tell you how to do it, but with a equalizing factor to kind of show apples to apples there. And that's where we know that we would have been, a, we were a disadvantaged district under Act 127. That is not the number you see here on, on, the, on the board. That was the first number we used. Then we got clarity to use a different number, which is essentially doing the column on the right, FY24 budget, if Act 127 were in place. Like that didn't happen, right? But that is if it had been in place. Does that make sense, Rhett? Kind of, sort of. yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it kind of makes sense to me too. <laughs> so does that um, increase, quote unquote, increase in in um, equalized pupils translate to a decrease in projected um, effect on the tax? Yes, slightly. So uh, while I don't have the number exactly right here and I don't want to take the time to pull it up, yeah. I believe this lower yellow number, the 17.89% number, mm -hmm. um, last time, actually, Jill's got the presentation 18. right now. 18. I think it's 18 point something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that decreases the equalized mm -hmm. tax rate slightly, which is the tax rate prior to CLF. Um, okay, so for the community's benefit, in order to have this conversation, Jimmy and I had a long conversation about how to jumpstart it to make it a little bit easier. Um, and the three of us decided to send the board an anonymous survey um, simply to jumpstart this conversation. In the last board meeting last Wednesday, you remember that um, we showed pie charts of percentages of, of potential cuts. Um, for the board to ask questions about and ponder throughout this week. Um, and so just yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, yesterday, I sent out the anonymous Google survey to see where board members were kind of landing in that. Um, and so really all it asked them to do was rank the five categories that were shown in the ideas um, presented last week, um, and then add any other comments. So this, the what the community will see right now in the board for that matter, we'll see the results of that survey um, put into a bar graph. So responses to the anonymous survey um, where cuts should be made to the board, not to the community, but to the board. Um, this is already assuming if we, we are anticipating that we will have to cut approximately 800,000, just as a reminder, approximately 800,000 from our budget in order to come below the 10% uh number the in top yellow number the top yellow number in order for our budget to be capped um somebody told me told business managers and superintendents at a conference this week to not use jargon and i was like how do you explain this <laughs> using jar i don't know so i'm kind of i'm stumbling around based on that um so if we have a eight hundred thousand that we need to cut that we're anticipating 
Um, what the board was asked to do was to assume that 400,000 of that, at least 50% of that 800,000 would be in staffing and benefits. The reason being is staffing and benefits is 80% of our salary and the there's budget. our budget, sorry, thank you, ma'am, is of our budget. And there really is no way to get to $800,000 without thinking about staffing and benefits a bit. So what Mia, Jim, and I um, decided on the survey was to assume there would be $400,000 in cuts to staffing and benefits. Um, and then we asked the, the board members to prioritize the five ideas that were presented to them. Um, so school individual school budgets, each school has a budget that they have. Principals are in charge of those budgets. Um, they include things like teacher supply lines, field trip lines, um, things that are very individualized to the school. The board looked at transportation. The board looked at increasing the fund balance, uh, facilities, and staff and benefits. So what I did with the responses this afternoon was I looked at four and five. If, if somebody ranked it as a four or five, um, then they were willing to take those cuts, right? They were more willing to make those cuts than other cuts. If somebody ranked something as a two or a three, it was in the middle. And if somebody ranked something as a zero or one, um, they really didn't want to look towards cuts there. Does ranking all make sense to everybody? <laughs> uh, and so the responses were um, what you see right here. So um, six board members out of our nine said that the school budgets would be something they would be willing to look at for cuts as a, as a larger percent or as a percentage of that pie chart to get to the other $400,000. Um, transportation was also highly ranked by the board members. Five board members said that transportation should be a place that we could make, um, that could be a big part of the pie. The one that stood out that was don't, don't do any more there is staffing and benefits. So the board were quite clear with six people again that that is not something they're willing to do beyond the 400,000. So the, the question around staffing and benefits would be, we're going to, we know we have to cut $400,000 from staffing and, staffing and benefits. Um, do you want to do more than that? And the six members of the board were quite clear that that was not a place they were willing to go. Any, I just want to stop right here from the board. Any any questions just on this? Kind so of what confusing. does the facility say? So is that saying that most of us said it was a two or a three? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And I just wanted to say, just to piggyback off of what Libby was saying, is that this is really just so that we could jumpstart the conversation. We wouldn't hold, I mean, we don't even know who those six board yeah. members are, but we wouldn't hold you to it if you decided over the course of right. tonight's discussion, actually, no, don't touch school budgets for example. Um, it really was just to give us something as a launch point um, to be able to start the conversation. So there were two open-ended comment boxes for the board to be able to make comments. Um, and the themes, we put these into themes. Um, so there was a theme around no more reduction in force. So no more, that would be a riff, no more reduction in force, staff and benefits than the 400,000K. However, retirement buyouts are supported by the board which have already been offered into our, our three unions. Um, transportation, keep all transportation to Roxbury was a theme from a few board members and cut Main Street Middle School busing was a theme for from a few board members. Use the fund balance. Um, so consider unencumbering money for the track was a theme, but from a couple board members. Uh, facilities, cut out any renovations, but no deferred maintenance was a theme that that came out and stay away from the student experience. So just generalizing what you all said, not using your direct quotes, but generalizing what you all said, these were the themes that popped out. Um, Is there a way to see, if, I feel like Jake or Jim might have a question. I feel maybe I'm, let's, we can, yeah. Oh, there's Jake. <laughs> Jake, just shout out and, and uh, interrupt yeah. me. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have your little squares on the screen right now. So go ahead, that's Jake. That's the reason we have it. Do I have a square on the screen? Now we do. OK. Um, so um, sorry to, uh, there were a couple slides a few few slides ago that went by kind of quickly. Um, but um, the, the student count, um, it's now 1860, roughly. Um, so 
are you feeling like co confident in that number or is that something that you're not wanting to use at this time? Well, we have put it in there. So we're confident enough to put it into the, the um, calculation. However, we don't make that final decision. The, the, the agency of education is expected to give that to us any day now. Okay. Cause um, on it's so, you know, the 10% increase that we're trying to avoid, um, that's for, that's on per pupil spending. So it's not on overall budget. Um, right. So now that there's more pupils, the per pupil spending amount, I don't know what the, you know, what the target is, but it's something, you know, higher than 14,193. Um, You know, if you take last year's per pupil spending and multiply it, you know, add 10% to it, it's 14,647. Um, so I think there might be more space than we think there is. Slightly, perhaps. We'll see what the number is and we'll have that. I'm, a, I'm anticipating we'll have it by next week when, when we do the actual first draft of the budget. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so from, this is from the survey and like what Mia said, nobody is, <laughs> nobody is committed to what they said, but from the anonymous survey of the board members, the clear direction that I could see is to make cuts from school budgets. So again, that's teacher supplies, field trips, new library books, that kind of thing. That's where the principals would be taking that from. Um, and number two, transportation. And so I just put what we talked about, this was known information from last week with a, just an addition of the number of students. So eliminating busing for students living in Montpelier who attend Main Street Middle School affects about 125 students daily to the cost of $170,000. Eliminating the late bus for students living in Roxbury affects approximately three students daily and that's to the tune of $25,000. Eliminating the after school bucks for Roxbury Village School is really hard to predict because of the state of the after school program next year, uh, families will have to pay for that, which they won't this year. So currently that affects one to five students, but that number could go up if, if people decide not to do the after school program. And that cost is approximately $35,000. Um, and it was very clear that the board members did not want to make any more cuts beyond the $400,000 from staffing and benefits. Um, I don't know what I was saying, the survey. Well, we asked that directly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very clear. Yeah. And so thank you. <laughs> it's like, what did I write? Um, there was one comment that was not a theme because only one person said it, uh, to eliminate the extra, the positions that were added using ESSER funds. Um, which of course would be staffing and benefits eliminations. There's a little contradiction there. And I would just point out that those positions that were added to using ESSER funds are interventionists. And that's what they are. There are no other positions that um, we've added besides academic interventionists through ESSER funding. Did we add social emotional learning interventionists using ESSER through or local, something else? That was local that funds. Was local. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there's more discussion needed around facilities. Um, how much is the board looking at? That was kind of a middle ground piece. Um, so there's more discussion around that. The fund balance, there's some discussion needed there. Currently with the track money encumbered, the board can add 200,000 to the already committed 400,000 in this budget. Okay, so we've already committed in that revenue source, there is already $400,000 committed from the fund balance. And in order to stay within policy, the board could add approximately 200,000 more. Um, the board can take action to unencumber the money for the track, which opens up, of course, more money. Uh, and number three, staffing and be benefits um, plus school plus school budgets, just to give you an overall sense of where we're at right now, um, is $435,000 uh, total, because I suggested last week that the, the school budgets would be around $35,000, $10,000 for each Montpelier school and $5,000 from Roxbury Village School. Um, that, of course, is not a set number in stone, right? That's just what I presented to you. 
So if we were using that figure, we would need approximately $365,000 more to come up from transportation facilities and the use of additional fund balance. I also want to put out to the board that um, we're not necessarily asking for specific ideas from the board. We're still asking for kind of percentages and chunks. Um, and then it's our job next week to come back to you to show you specifics specifics on what it is that we've cut. Mm -hmm. um, so if that makes sense to the board, then I will send it over to Mia to open it up for discussion. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, why don't we start with questions? Yeah, um, for clarification. I can't or... remember, when are we? When does the facilities work that's currently happening, when do they like give us a report or something? You have to look at the RFP. Because I'm, I'm feeling like there could be some really good nuggets of information in there. I think that's probably why we're having them do that. So it's a little late for this cycle, but they might find some really interesting, you know, I don't know, just as soon as we can get it, it'd be helpful to see how that, because if we might think we know what to do about a certain building or heating systems or whatever, they might have come up with a different. The interim report to the school board for that is March 20th. Okay. Thank you. The final report is May 15th. Okay. Thanks. One of the slides said cuts from transportation for MSMS, not Roxbury. And I felt the slightest wisp of hope. And then the cuts were cuts to the late bus and cuts to the after school bus, the PM bus. I don't understand. That seems like a, I don't understand the discrepancy. No, no, no. I was just sharing with the board the um the slide. So this is this is something from this is something that needs more discussion. So people people were pretty positive that transportation was a place where cuts could be made in order to make up this money. Um and I wanted to give the board the the figures there. Uh, these are the three options that were considered that were talked about last week. So we could say. Yep, do them all, which would be 195, 230. Or we could say do all, but now this might be a place where direction from the board would be useful to you at a little bit more of a granular yeah, level because than we just have, transportation. Yeah. Um, there aren't too many buckets in transportation. Right. right. So we, so, but we could also say just do the Main Street Middle School bus, which is students who live in Montpelier and take the bus to Main Street Middle School which would just be 170. Does that help clarify yes. that? Yeah. And right now with the direction that we've gotten the board, from the board so far, our total that we've gotten to is 435 and we need to find 365,000. 400, we're at 435,000. We need to find 365,000. So just as a hypothetical, we as a board could say, let's do the Main Street Middle School bus at 170 and let's do an extra 200,000 from our fund balance and we're there, just as a hypothetical, we mm -hmm. could do that. We could also say, no, go bigger on school budgets and do something else, you know, that's. So are there any other questions that folks have? I see Miriam and then Scott, um, just to try and understand the presentation, I think would be, let's get that all out and then we, let's hear thoughts that people have. And then just like last week, we'll open up to public comment after that. Is there is the reason that you're using the four hundred thousand dollar cut already from staffing and benefits that there's I realize this is a matter of judgment, but that there's no plausible way to reach the eight hundred thousand dollar cut without that cut? Cool. There probably is. However, it'd be significant cuts to facilities, transportation. 80% of our budget is staffing and benefits. So there's going to have to be some work done there. And there was already some planned things that we've discussed as we've discussed last week. Like there was, because of enrollment, a K-6 uh, license position would be reduced because of enrollment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I don't know if this question is for for Jake or for um for Libby, but Jake, if I understood your question and the answer correctly, are the target based on the the projections and numbers that we have now is not 
is no longer 800,000, but something less than 800,000 that we would need to reduce for next this coming budget. It will still be around that. Remember, that's an anticipated potential. Yep. So it could be 740, it could be 820, right? So career center tuition just rose. So that just adds to our to our need, you know, like things are changing. Just keep that in mind that yep. we are still very early in the budget season. Mm -hmm. Even in a typical season, this would be the board meeting that we you see the first draft, right? So we've pushed that back a week. Um, and as more veteran <laughs> board members will know, and you know from serving on Randolph's board, we get more solid numbers as the budgeting process keep, goes on. And even when we send a budget out to the voters, we still don't have totally solid numbers. So um, I would say we're still hovering around the 800,000 based on things coming in. Pre-K tuition, just we just learned it went up today. Like I just got an email right before the board meeting. So there's there are things that are still waffling out there that are influence that can influence that number. And I think it's safe to go with around eight hundred thousand. It may be less. It may be yeah. a little bit more. And I think it would be great for us to be in a position a month from now go to say, oh, actually we can great. put something back in the budget. Then to again a month from now have to do another, which has happened in years past. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. has happened okay. in years past, like significantly so. So. I don't know, maybe they're pleasantly surprised. <laughs> Would that be nice? <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm connecting all the dots. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good. Um, so coming back to the numbers that you mentioned, so 435, and that we need to we need to get another 365 to reach our eight um, our 800,000. So the 435 is staff and benefits. We're assuming we need to cut 400,000 from there, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the additional 35. Where does that come from when you say 435? School, individual school budget. Okay, great. And so then when the slide that lists kind of our other potentials, that's that's kind of showing us the ranking and, and the priorities or Libby, that's kind of you taking our rankings and saying, this is where they could come from and this is the amount they equate to and how far they would get us yeah. in hitting that 365. Just like to make sure I've got it all up there. Wait, are you okay. asking about the bar graph or are you asking no. about the okay? Yeah. You were asking about the one that had the board. yeah. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the current yep. pots. <laughs> got it. Okay. Um. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> did on the bar graph did was one of the options about the fund balance? Yes. Yes. And where did did that just fall like in the middle? That fell in the middle. Oh, in the okay. middle yeah. It fell in the middle. Okay. Um. So it sounds like Rhett and then Scott. I I I have a, a fuzzy memory that the pie chart number one had uh salary and benefits of sixty-five percent of the eight hundred thousand and, and that accounts to about five hundred and twenty thousand. But I thought that there was uh, a path that wasn't gonna have a strong impact on the student experience. Finding five hundred and twenty thousand in salary and benefits was that not? I I just I thought that it, it, there was a couple of there were, there were some rip positions that were expected. There were a couple of things that were sort of expected, and then there was a possibility that um, potential retirements would fit in there. And and, and it I had a memory that it it, it would get to five hundred twenty thousand um, without too much pain in a sense. Is that right? We can get to um, 400,000 without very much pain. I mean, we're talking about people's positions, but um, we can get yeah. to $400,000 in staffing and benefits through the uh, K6 RIF with enrollment that we know about, not filling a couple open positions um, that haven't been open all year, uh, and potential retirements. So I am not hopeful on the retirement piece. On finding a significant amount of money that helps us this budget year on the retirement piece. Um, so, so four hundred is the, the number, and that's just my hunch. That's just my hunch in knowing of my colleagues. That that's all that's based on right there. Well, hopefully, people like it here. <laughs> <laughs> Could I say one one comment before you go? I just want to look at that the bar graph of our responses. Great. Oh, sure. If you I can just pop that up, that up, I can probably answer my own question. 
I just, the thing I wanted to comment on was this word pain, because um, I think no matter what we do here, it's go there's going to be pain, including making decisions to not make cuts causes pain in the other direction of hardship of increased taxes, particularly on people who might not be able to bear that hardship. And so when we're talking about pain, I think it's important for not only to for us to keep that impact in mind and hold that very carefully, but also to be thinking we are we need to make these decisions at a systems wide level and we now have the benefit as a board and as a community of having priorities that we have just recently articulated based on a great community engagement process where we got a vision from our community that we need to be prioritizing closing the achievement gap and and belonging safety and wellness and so when we say pain we should probably be thinking less about although it's very hard the pain that individual members of our community will be feeling because that is hard, very hard, but also we need to be thinking more about what not about staying true to those priorities and using those priorities to guide us. So I appreciate Red, you framing that as what are the cuts that get us that have the least amount of impact on the student experience? Because that is a major factor that the board needs to be considering. Do you still have a question after looking at the bar graph? I was gonna like geek out on the stats and then I don't, <laughs> I don't know that it's worth it because it's really just our opinions right. at that moment in time. And so, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna um, yeah. What's yeah. It, defer my time to the- <laughs> Yield? Yield, yield my time. Yield the time. remainder of your time to the book. The woman from Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm- I really appreciate how much explanation and thought has gone into making this really transparent because it's helping make some decisions. Um, and we're talking a lot about the student experience and I, I'm heartbroken to say that I do feel like it feels a little blind to not be looking at the money that we have in the fund balance. I think we've been hit by like a literal and metaphorical flood since then. I just feel like we're in such a completely different financial place. We had this fund balance that was healthy. We had huge community and student support. We were, I mean, that was a great use of one-time funds. And I don't want us to do the thing where you buy it down one year and then our tax rates are still impacted. But it does feel really um, a little blind to, to be talking about, you know, 10,000, 30,000 here and not talk about the money that we have encumbered or at least some of the fund balance to put towards it. So I guess I'm advocating to consider maybe using some of the fund balance. Okay. I have another question. Um, there's been so much discussion about the track or not the track and what's going to happen to that money. Was that involved? In, is that in here anywhere? It or came up as a theme in the open-ended the open-ended thoughts. It is not represented in any of the numbers that I've shared with the board because that for me, from my position as superintendent, the board has not given me the rights to touch that yet, right? That's your decision. That's not my decision to make. And so, because the board encumbered that money for the track. So anytime you see increased fund balance, as of right now, I am asking the board to draw the line at $200,000 because your own policy has set that, has set an amount that needs to stay available for the district's use. And if you spend more than $200,000 as it is now with the money that is encumbered for uh, for not just the track, but other projects as well, um, you will go below your policy number. Of how much money we need to have in the- Right. The, of liquid in the fund, money yeah, exactly. in the fund balance. Exactly. Does that make sense, Lynn? I understand what you're saying. Um, and I guess my question is more, um, is the track, has the track been set aside or has it just been assumed that it's part of the fund? The board took action to encumber that money. The board voted um, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Okay. So the, the fund balance, the fewer of us said anything about the fund balance. So there, 
my, I, I, I had a question when I was filling it out about that and some people didn't respond at all. And so I'm wondering, yeah, there are far fewer responses to the fund balance than the oh, others. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm curious. So I, again, I don't think it's as important to talk about the survey, but maybe talk through what that might mean. Yeah. Yeah. And since we're talking about it now. That's great. That's a great idea. And then I just want to make sure, again, Jim and Jake, we can't see your squares. So if your hands are raised, um, or maybe you can stop sharing your screen, I guess, so that we can see their squares. Yeah, we just it keeps sharing and unsharing. So. Yeah, that's okay. I think it's helpful to show the slides again if people need to see yeah. them. Um, so the question on the table is, I get, I think if I'm just going to phrase, frame a specific question is we have $365,000 more to find. How much of that do people, would people propose come from the fund balance? Again, just as a reminder, because there's a lot of numbers being thrown around in our regular budget, we're already projecting to draw 400,000 from the fund balance as a source of revenue. So we're is that how much more than that would board members like would board members like to see drawn? I mean, I need to watch this on balance. Oh, it's a little I, over two million. Right? Yeah, I, I don't have that on me right now. I have it. It was, a, it it was, was in the most recent quarterly financial report. Yeah, we should it was be in our financial committee. Mm -hmm. Looks finance like Rhett committee. might have it at his fingertips. I don't have that handout with me, Red, so it's on you. Impressive, Red. I can find it. Uh, and it's the board um, policy, a percentage of our 577,000 over the 2% limit from as of first quarter fiscal year 24. That's what it says on the paper. It's my favorite question about Christina. Yeah. yeah. I remember looking at this. I thought I saw her on <clears throat> But that's the, there's so the total the figure. This, these are, this is see. the unencumbered. Got it. Right. And so this is the stuff set aside for the, like the, the track is here. And then this, this F fiscal year and next fiscal year. Right. So. So does that constitute this a discrepancy then the 200,000 versus the 577 if, or maybe we're going to get finality on here, because this is but Libby, by your calculations too, we could yeah. draw another 200,000 yeah. in order to still be in with up to date numbers with our fund balance okay. of what she had and what had already been committed. Yep. Oh, which sorry. could be this, different than what's what, on the first quarter thinking. report because yep. we're now well into the sure. second quarter. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And it was so around, exactly is, is it exactly 200? It was around 200,000. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. 927. In addition to the 400. Yes. Total. But we have to okay. And the track is part of that. No, that's set aside then. Uh, right. really Outside of the yeah. extra 200,000 yeah. that's available, that still keeps keep us within all the parameters. Yeah. But we have the requirements we have. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. And knowing that for four more years, we may be in so somewhat of a similar dilemma. So we don't want to put all of our eggs in this basket. I would agree with that statement, yes. Yeah. So if, if anybody who's following along at home would really like to see these numbers themselves, you can find them in the meeting documents for the November 1st, 2023 meeting. They It's in the FY24 quarter one financial report on page uh, two, at the top of page two. The, and again, as Libby just pointed out, this is a little bit old because it's the end of quarter one and not, and we are well into quarter two, but our complete and total fund balance is $3,677,019. Now there are assigned items, including the revenue that streams that we plan on using for FY24, the year we're in, FY25 next year, each of those are 400,000. So that takes that down by 800,000 already. Then there's the committed fund balance that the board voted on for that's 1.9 million to um, intended for track upgrades. 
And then there is an unreserved set aside of 50,000 for the potential net zero study, which brings us to a fund balance that there's no plan for <laughs> of about $927,019. And that number is about $350,000 over the 2% limit. So there's also the equity audit is coming out of the fund balance. The facilities work is coming out of the fund balance, which essentially equals another hundred thousand. Another hundred thousand, which takes us down to two hundred, which takes us down to two hundred fifty thousand dollars over that two percent limit. And that two percent is what the board has in policy that we have to have liquid and unassigned and available to us in our fund balance. I believe there's also been some small facilities things that have come out of that as well. So right out, out of that last remaining 50,000, Jim is saying he'd like to jump in. Right. So just to, <laughs> just, to clear, just to close that thought, those are where you could find those numbers to be able to do that math to say, oh yeah, we get it. Another $200,000 is what we could quote unquote easily move from the fund balance on top of the 400,000 we were already planning. And now Jim, I'll uh, uh, first off, apologies. I'm in an airport, so you might hear uh, Sorry, announcement. Jim, Can you hear me? I hate to interrupt you while you're apologizing, but I just wanted to give Lynn a chance to finish her thought before I move oh, on. Sorry. My bad. If we use that, that would leave us with nothing for the next. That would leave us with the policy, with your policy. Your policy has a statement. Right, but it. I mean, where we're with the requirements we've set for ourselves. Yes. 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 If we use the 200,000 this year, that would leave us with no more fund balance to draw from in future years. Based Unless, on our current policy. Right. Cover the yes. money. right. Yeah. Great questions. While Jen's talking, could you pop a slide up that just has the, um, like the transportation figures, just the other kind of topic areas and the assigned uh, costs, please. You got to say It might help to share the the slides with board members now so they can have it on their computers. All right, Jim, take it away. All right, so a few thoughts and um, you're gonna hear some airport announcements and one, sorry if I repeat some of this, but said, I think it might make a lot of sense if we unencumber that money for the track and just put it as a set aside for future budgets for the administration to um, potentially use and also for, you know, the potential aftershock of when the 5% cap goes away. I think it's a distraction to have it named for the track right now. I think the chance of it going to the track is pretty slim. Um, and I think it just, it just might clear some confusion. I think set aside that money for what we probably want it to be set aside for, which is to give us some room to maneuver over the next few years just an idea i think i think it would be smart um as much as i really support the track and we're just in a very different situation now than we were when we uncovered that money for the track um second i think if we do that we have to realize that this is a five-year game and we should be very careful about trying to extend its utility as far as possible and use it very judiciously so we're um, not saving ourselves from one year's disaster to create a much bigger uh, you know, shortfall the next year. So um, use it to, to kind of as a glide path to, to make it easier for us, not to avoid, I think you did a really good job of framing the, the pain issue, not to avoid some temporary pain for some like maybe more intense future pain. I, I, think, I think that could be very tempting uh, to avoid making hard decisions. And uh, we're going to have to be very kind of conservative with that money. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. But I, I think, I think, yeah, I think we things have changed since the, the track was the intended use of that money. And I think it just might be uh, clear to the community what we're thinking, how we're thinking about that money if we kind of officially changed um what we have designated it's used for all right thank you jim jim just to clarify are you proposing we vote on that on unencumbering the track money tonight i think if if we're ready to if not maybe the next meeting i mean 
it's and and if and if we want to keep it in covered for the track i think that's fine too i just think we should kind of what i'm hearing in the discussion is is that and probably the community is here too like that that money is set aside for the track and and it's it's not at least you know for this year something that we're thinking about in terms of a revenue source maybe for future years and i think we are at least thinking about it as a revenue source for future years um and especially if we use you know the extra two hundred thousand dollars now um then probably next year we're going to be in a place where we're going to have to go to that money anyways um so i i think in in less you know and unless we feel there's a substantial chance that, that we want to keep that money for the track, I think renaming the designation makes sense. Um, and I know there's definitely some, you know, rumblings and confusion in the community. I don't think it's widespread, but, you know, we've seen this kind of flare up before that, you know, the, that this money is that we're still thinking about, this money as track money and i don't think we're really thinking about this money as track money i think we're thinking about this money as money that we're probably going to need to use over the next four to five years to you know to kind of deal with the 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 implications from act 127 um and i think it's just a confusing message to the community to to still have it be officially designated as tracked money because every time we say that that's what they that's what people hear and for legitimate reasons so i think if we just cleared up the confusion and you know look if the legislature comes in this year and fixes act 127 and we're in a very different situation next year and we don't do something like spend all this money this year you know we could still revive the track conversation um but i think where we are currently that designation is creating confusion and i don't think it's making a track any more likely yeah yeah and that that i hear that jim and um libby just reminded me if we were going to vote on that we would need it to be warned on the agenda so tonight is not the night to take that vote um but duly noted and we should put it on an agenda as its own item to have that conversation so that the public is fully aware mm -hmm. when that's going to happen I don't think I have anyone on the stack after Jim. Who wants to go next? I just want to, I don't want to repeat everything Jim said, but I just want to agree with all that. If as much as I'm still hopeful about a track as a track runner, um, if we don't have any intention currently of building a track, I think it's probably making some community members either hopeful or angry or anywhere in between yeah. more than is needed. Yeah. Thanks, Miriam. Um, I was going to see if there was anyone on the board who wanted to try and fill that $365,000 hole with a proposal before we open it up for public comment. Or if board members would rather at this point hear from the public in order to be able to have that conversation, I'm fine with that too. Were you raising your hand? So that's not the conversation around salary and benefits or school budgets, but the other piece. Mm -hmm. Fund balance transportation facility. Uh -huh. You could say part of that $365,000 I personally, as a board member, would like to see more cuts to salary and benefits. That could be a thing you put on the table, but yeah, generally okay. answering your question, yes. Yeah, that that won't be what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I the I I'm wondering about the transportation piece, um, and I and maybe this is a conversation for next week, and so because I I are how is the current transportation policy for MSMS? um applied if how is the policy for busing students to msms currently applied and what would we be taking away by cutting that so you would be i'm not sure how to answer the policy mm -hmm. question i mean i think i just last week monitored we, we it monitored. last week so we mm -hmm. did pull up that monitoring report um 
Vermont is a, is a privileged state, it's called, with busing and transportation. So we are not required as a school district mm -hmm. to provide busing. Yep. Um, and uh, under policy, there's no direct schools that you have promised busing to under policy. Um, how it would influence Main Street Middle School is that when it came into existence was my first budget year as a superintendent here at Montpelier Roxbury, and it was framed as an equity issue um, and that it was inequitable to not bust the kids at Main Street Middle School because of their mm -hmm. youth and because of distances from the schools, because of the large hill that was is right because of the street. There's lots of things that was that were yeah. brought to it. So currently, any student at Union, any student in Union and Main Street Middle School who live beyond a mile radius of the school um, can take the opportunity yeah. to ride a bus. And there are no other factors considered in that decision. No, it's it's a mile radius. That's it. And there's a those buses that serve Montpelier schools only. Mm -hmm. um, they are full. They're they're yeah. complete. So there's 77 kid buses and yeah. they're full. The reason I ask is not all miles in Vermont are equal, right? Yep. Like, um, and so a mile, so if you live two miles and there are sidewalks the entire way versus if you live half a mile and there are no sidewalks, right? There, so to me, that nuance is, is important. And so I'm, I'm. It depends if you live a mile away and you live up Town Hill Road. Again, right? so there's that's, like that's sidewalks. Sidewalks was just one, yeah, yeah, yeah. one <laughs> of the sidewalk, factors. But that's pretty significant. And so, is it? Would it be feasible to have a policy where you have to opt into busing for MSMS, and in order to do so, there are certain factors that you. Um, I think. I mean, sure, we could try something like that. And Jim was talking about earlier, maybe just bus the fifth graders. Like, could we limit the number of kids who are able to take that ad advantage? The challenge with the with the suggestion you just had that I can think of just off the top of my I'm just talking off the top of my head because yeah, I have not thought mind, about that, right? Is that that makes it very difficult for the bus company to figure out who's supposed to be on that bus and who's not. And so um I can imagine that the bus company, I don't want to speak for them, yeah. but I can imagine that they would walk at that pretty hardcore, um, that only these kids ride the bus and that you only pick up these kids mm -hmm. and drive by the other kids that are just as far a distance at, you know, negative 20 degrees Celsius or for Fahrenheit or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think that that's a tricky scenario for the bus because we contract that, right? That wouldn't be on us, that would be on them. Um, the bus well, company. how does the bus company know? They do it by by um, because you don't only kindergartners get picked up door to door, so they they do it by bus stop. So they have essentially mm -hmm. the same bus stops every year mm -hmm. um, because that's where kids generally live, you know. And if there's a there's a kid who lives like it's happened once or twice, if a kid moves into a neighborhood that doesn't have a bus stop anywhere near them, um, they usually write to the bus company and see what happens How about getting one yeah uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah you. it's I, I would never want to work for a bus company <laughs> ever <laughs> it's like the most thankless job ever both doing yeah. the routes and driving the buses jill you have a question oh, we're sticking with transportation right now do you, oh, you jim also want to jump in on transportation okay and then i also have a question on so we'll go jill are you you're not a, your question is not on transportation no i thought you asked us like to kick off where we were at percentages yeah <laughs> percentages but I, I, love love that. That. I love that i love that it sounds I, like we're still in the information gathering mode of of what do the numbers really mean so let's see if we can yeah, close yeah. that loop and then okay jim you wanted to chime in on transportation yeah no just because i was i was um you know around when when this discussion happened i mean there are a few i think and, and Libby, Libby, I think, articulated many of the considerations with the FSMS busing, but a little extra context. One is when when the issue really heated up was when uh, UES used to be K through five, but when it went through K through four, uh, you know, having those fifth graders not be bused 
I, I think got the attention of a lot of of caregivers and community members because you know the the younger you know Scott just well articulated that you know not all miles in Vermont are the same, but also you know kids kids' ability to kind of like navigate those tough miles you know with judgment and um uh et cetera just becomes more and more difficult and and more and more of a safety issue the younger the kids are uh you know so fifth grade really kind of precipitated the the conversation so there's definitely that issue of you know some of the seventh and eighth graders that are a little older are probably more able to safely get to school from a longer distance you know the fifth graders in particular uh I, I think there are some legitimate challenges there. I think it's also worth noting that a lot of uh, the the families that benefit from busing and will be impacted from pulling back busing are some of the community's lower income families, uh, you know that that don't necessarily have um, perhaps as much means and flexibility. They're oftentimes you know, families where. Uh, you know, the, the caregivers are in service jobs that have kind of less flexibility than, you know, office jobs, especially kind of post COVID, uh, and, um, are living in kind of the outskirts on places, you know, like down terrace, downtown Hill on the other side, you know, up Berlin street, up towards Berlin, uh, et cetera, uh, you know, where they have some barriers that, um, yeah, some other families don't have in terms of being able to get their kids safely to school. So uh, I just wanted to point out the you know, the, the equity issue was, was not just kind of in terms of, you know, age and grades, but also, uh, you know, where some of the outer limits of our, uh, you know, circle of transportation are and, um, you know, kind of some of the demographics there and, and the type of families that, that are getting impacted the most by by not having transportation. Thank you. That's helpful, Jim. Then Kristen, and then I have a couple of questions. Great. So um, I have comments that kind of hit on some of the themes that, you know, Jim is is just bringing up. I think, um, you know, as we've been wrangling with this in the last week, which it feels like it's been weeks, you know, I was like, well, like, you know, the big yellow bus feels as synonymous with public school as like a carton of milk. <laughs> and it's just not, you know, it's just not that way. And, you um, you know, and I'm thinking about Roxbury and I'm thinking about the geography of Roxbury, which is a 42 square mile town, categorically rural, um, you know, the distance from East Roxbury to, you know, kind of the far reaches to Roxbury Village School is about, I think, nine miles, a 17 minute drive. Um, so this we're talking about like a pretty extensive uh, it's, you know, so for out for to come to the school and to drive home is a 34 minute drive for for a parent. Um, you know, when I hear from in our community, you know, we have families that uh, are working families and that are operating out of one vehicle. And I think about the value of the bus, um, you know, to those families. I I feel concern about uh, the elimination of the bus at the end of the school day when we don't at this point have an after school program kind of concept in place. I hear that there are intentions and there's thinking happening around this, um, but I definitely have concerns for our families, especially kind of, you know, and from, you know, very much that that equity lens, you know, and thinking about our goals that we've set around, you know, chronic absenteeism, belonging, kids need to be able, and I'm glad to hear, because I think at the last board meeting, it was, it was being considered also eliminating the morning bus route to RVS. Um, which, am I correct? That was also included, I think, in one of the options. Yeah, no? Okay, so um, glad to hear that was... I don't think so. I don't think I have on the list in front of me and I don't see it. Okay, so I'm glad to hear that's not, uh, you know, on there, but just thinking about um, without the after-school program that I think currently about 90% of our families rely on, um, in the thinking, Libby, that you and your team have done, has there been any talk about um, pursuing licensing for an after-school program such that there would be subsidy so it would be more within the reaches of, uh, you know, our lower income families. We have not talked about that and we don't have the staff to do that. that that's an, an intense process. Yeah, that we I, don't I'm have aware. Staff, I'm just, yeah, I know you, yeah. you would know that. Yeah, you are aware of that. Yeah. 
So I'm just thinking about that, you know, if if it's feeling, you know, financially out of reach for families at that after at end of the school day bus would feel like it's going to be a very critical piece for kids mm -hmm. getting back home. Yeah, so, that's right. That's hard to predict. Yeah. yeah. I am, I will tell from my opinion, if I can give it for transportation, I think, I honestly think cutting transportation for a required event of students, meaning you are required BS, BS to be school. at school, um, is something the board should really think about carefully before making that decision when they, before they absolutely have to make that decision. Doesn't matter which school we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. I think that is a, that is a question that the board should consider, put a lot of thought and consideration and discussion to. So, so my questions are, um, can you say a little bit more about why it's, why the bus to Main Street Middle School for Montpelier residents is $170,000 a year if it's already on the routes that they would be doing for UES? Buses. We had to add buses. Mm -hmm. So it's new, more buses that are costing yeah. that. Much. I believe we added two, but it could have been three. We, we had to add at least two buses, buses in order to fit the amount of kids. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to um, actually ask a question then about facilities. So I'm changing topics a little bit, but it's again to try and understand the full picture. In the three options that we looked at as like potential scenarios last week, it looked like the biggest number you went with for facilities, again, kind of just as putting it out there, was around $144,000. And that included, you know, um, not doing classroom renovations and doing some deferred maintenance. Would you say 144,000 is the highest you would recommend we go on facilities? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we wouldn't be 365. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the board can make that decision. Yeah. I would highly recommend yeah. not doing that. Right. I get that. We have two very old buildings, mm -hmm. three, including mm -hmm. half of Roxbury, not the renovated half, but that's right. really, Roxbury doesn't have many facilities challenges. Yeah. And a building that was just flooded. Yeah. Um, and when I said that 144,000 number, you cringed significantly. Do you have a more like, if we were, facilities was one of the places that was like kind of middle of the road where some of us are like, yeah, we yeah. could cut from that, but not all of us were, um, Actually, most of us were like, yeah, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Yeah. Do you have a number that you feel better about than 144, <laughs> but also maybe a little higher than 22, which was in idea one for us? I think probably we could, um, we would not want to cut facilities drastically every year. But I think yeah. if we're talking about a one year, get us through FY25's budget process. Sorry that my back is to y'all. There's less people over here. Um if we're talking about get us through FY25, right, we could probably comfortably do around $100,000 in facilities okay. for this budget for year, year because it would be one-time costs that we wouldn't be doing yeah. that Andrew may have been planning to do. Yeah. Um, and maybe one-time furniture costs, you know, or, you know, something like that, that um, wouldn't hurt us drastically to not do. And this doesn't include... Um, keeping uh not making our investment in the capital plan it does not include that that is included in our budget yeah because that is not something we've discussed is it's not that, something that. the board has discussed right. it's so the hundred thousand would be from our regular general budget yeah mm -hmm. regular facilities budget okay thank you that's helpful for me any other questions on lay of the land or understanding what we're talking about or is everybody eagerly anticipating Jill's <laughs> proposal like Jim I am? Wanted... Jim wanted in. No, sorry. I was wondering if we wanted oh. to do the public comment and then, but I'm fine. I can, I can throw it out to start the discussion. Okay. Um, I, I, I actually understand this. I really appreciate how much work you guys <laughs> have put into it. And, and like the facility, that was my next question is like, what does that actually look like? Um, I do feel like I feel like we should use at least two hundred thousand from the fund balance. Um, it seems like it's a rainy day fund. It seems like it's healthy, knowing there's things coming on the pike and it's raining right now. Um, and it's really hard to leave that alone in the bank while we're talking about some of these other things. And then I would ask um, 
I guess I was sort of going to ask that. It's like, okay, so facilities, like what next week you'd come, you know, come back with, I'm sure Andrew has ideas. Not that mm -hmm. we want, this is He's already thinking about it. This yeah. isn't the way we want to think about this, but, um, and that way, if, if Jake's right and the, the numbers still fall our way a little bit, then that's all the better. But I feel like it would be irresponsible to make some of these more extreme smaller cuts when we've got some money in the fund balance. So I'd like to use a good chunk of the fund balance personally. Okay. What are you saying? And the like hundred thousand from facilities? Yep. And then hope for the best. And then hope, hope for the best hope for more numbers for next week. Which is something the board can say. Like right. let's start there and see where we're at next week. So I'm gonna click back to the napkin calculation checked by Mia is that's seven hundred and thirty five thousand. Yeah. You're that's close. Almost. Yeah. Now we're talking about fame. I know, I know. No, that is most definitely that's the kind of thing we're looking for for the board. This is the this is the direction we want you to go, right? We can do that. Um, and we next week's the first draft of the budget. So yeah. more specifics will be brought in. Hopefully we'll have better, solid, more solid numbers in terms of people counts and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's totally something the board could do. And that's also kind of spreading the pain, so to speak, right? So we have the salary, we have the facilities, we have the fund balance, we've got the school-based budget, right? We're, mm -hmm. And that also might buy us some time so that when we get the facilities report, we go into next year's budget cycle with a lot Different clearer idea. information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my two cents. Do folks have thoughts on Jill's and others <laughs> ideas? Um, Cause I don't want, if, if we hear from the public, like don't do that. And we're not only blaming Jill here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Jill's uh, but it's, it's Jake's hand. And then are there other folks who just have initial thoughts on that before I open it up to public comment? Okay. Yeah. Quick Me question about that. So we'll go Miriam and then we'll go Jake. Okay. Can someone just list out for me because I just blanked out a little bit um, what that 730 Thousand so four hundred thousand assumed for the staff. I was saying say two hundred thousand or so from the fund balance, mm -hmm. and then about a hundred thousand from facilities. And, and, oh, and trying to get five from the school budget. The, we're trying to get underneath the ten percent. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that does not include an MSMS cutting the MSMS. Correct. Correct. That's not currently right. in the calculation. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not even what, sorry, I'm way over. But that's okay. The MSMS bus. Okay. It's not currently in this calculation. So or any transportation. Cutting the MSMS. Yeah, MS. So right. the, oh, thank you. And I missed one. It's the four hundred thousand of the staffing that we started tonight off with. I think thirty-five thousand for the school, which is yeah. like field trips and library books, which really stinks. Really sucks. Um, and then say two hundred thousand from the fund balance, and then maybe a hundred thousand facilities, and that was getting us there, and then see Close. where things shake out. Yeah. But not cutting any busing that I said. Right. All right, Jake. Thanks. Um, I think that um, if we do find out um, next week that, that things are looking more favorable, um, that'll be a relief. Um, but um, we still are going to need to be really strategic because there's going to come a time. Um, I don't know exactly when, but we're not going to be protected by the 5% equalized rate thing. Um, and we don't want uh, a cliff at that point. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I hope for better numbers next week, but I think we are going to also have to uh, be very conscientious about long-term spending. Thank you for that reminder, Jake. Yeah, thanks, Jake. All right, why don't we pause board discussion and open it up to public comment for anyone who would like to share their thoughts after hearing us. Yeah, please come forward. And we have two folks in the room, two folks in the room, and then anybody who would like to um, online use the raise hand function on Zoom or go ahead and turn your camera on and physically raise your hand. We will uh, make sure you get in the queue. Yep. So first we'll go with the folks um, in the room and please, for everybody, please remember to introduce yourselves, name and where you are from. My name is Arthur Smith. I am from Roxbury 
And um, I have to uh, comment on the process because this brings to mind um, some of the graduate work I've done. Uh, and sometimes it's really nice to remember the context of why you study what you study. And I studied with Eleanor Ostrom, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, who addressed the issue of managing the commons which is really what you're doing here, the process of managing something that's a public value and the public ownership. And it's great to see how you work with the information that you have that's ever changing. And one thing she reminded us as students is that institutions are artifacts. They're artifacts of what we value at the time. So when I hear this refrain, and it's been a constant one, which is really encouraging to hear that as a school system for students, we value a sense of belonging, safety, and wellness. And that's a guiding principle in how you decide what actions you're going to take. And what you always told us, no matter how you model a problem, things change and the numbers change, everything changes. So you're always working with less than complete knowledge. So you have to work with the knowledge that you have. And one of the best things about the process that you have is you have so much information from the community about what they value and how you're working with it. So I think one takeaway from so many years ago is that we don't always have the information we need. Things change, but we have to really focus on what we value. And since it's been so clearly articulated on almost every discussion that you've had, the, prior, the priority you give, not just to academic performance, but the total wellness of a student. I look at some of the decisions that you're making and the pie charts that you give, and I was really encouraged to see post COVID that mental health and well being can be addressed. And sometimes numbers don't speak for themselves. Something may not make sense as far as cost benefit analysis, but there's more value in it than the dollar spent. And that's when I look at the transportation cost. Um, when you alienate students, and I've mentioned this before, that cost is well beyond the dollar value of transporting them because there are mental health issues associated with it. And what you have, you have wonderful tools in place. You have panorama. In time, you'll have more information. But right now, it's a matter of just getting through now and addressing the problem and seeing what we can do with what we have, taking a little bit more money, perhaps, than you might have anticipated from the, uh, I, I don't have all the language down, I guess the fund balance, um, and working with things staying in place for now. Because communities, and I know Roxville is very uh, Roxbury is very resourceful. We developed a beautiful garden in the middle of our town by bringing people together and resources together. And so if we have to come up with some per dollar mile of value for transfer, transporting students, maybe there'll be a friend fund. Maybe there'll be other initiatives. There's also a, re a, a, a recreation committee that's establishing that may wanna fund some of this. So we just need more time. And I think we've clearly articulated, you've clearly articulated what you value. You value the students and their total well-being, not just their grades. So I want to applaud you and your efforts and the process. And you are the pulse of the state. And you are really, when people look back 40 years at the artifact you've created, I think you're going to be proud. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Uh, my name is Nathan Suter. I'm a resident parent of two and um, something else that I'll come to in a minute. <clears throat> Thank you as always. I'm, I feel so grateful that we have such an intelligent and caring board. Uh, I love the way you work through this stuff. Um, I had one question which you can answer after I leave the stage which is I'm curious about when the equalized people numbers, right? There's a, I think there's like a daily census sort of how often that's sampled and when the final numbers. Based on October 1st counts. October 1st counts, okay. Um, and then I had a thought as you were discussing the fund balance, which is the way that I think, the way that it became 
uh, so robust over time is that we have either by budgeting carefully or getting lucky, it seems like every year there has there has been a surplus at the end of the budget year, which goes into the fund balance. Is that accurate? The more In complicated question than a yes or a no. Okay. <laughs> there so are some years we do not use the fully encumbered like 400,000 or whatever we based our budget on. And there are some years we do. Right. I just, to Lynn's, to one of Lynn's questions, I was thinking, well, um, it may, it may not be that by committing some of the fund balance now, we're then at a razor thin line next year because we may be fortunate again, gambling. Um, and then I want to reiterate that uh, for some, you know, there was a, a discussion about pain and or, or uh, difficulty and where that sits. And I think that it's good to remember that for many people in this community who are, who have a limited, you know, fixed income or limited income, their tax impact of budget decisions made by our district is income sensitized and they are protected in terms of their property taxes. And so I think that there are a portion of folks in town who do bear the the changes in the budget impact and those that largely don't, which is great. So I just to, I want to keep that in mind. Um, so the other the other identity that I have at this table is that I'm the uh, track coach for the middle school track team, and I also help with the middle school cross country team. So I have a vested interest in the in the um, funds allotted towards a renovated track. Uh, that said, I can't ignore the context that we're exist that we exist in right now. And I have a thought, which is um, one of the challenges we have with our current facility is that I think it's beyond sort of deferred maintenance. I think it's been neglected. That doesn't, you know, to have a functional track doesn't explicitly require that we have a brand new track. We could instead pay some attention to the facility we've got um, and so I wonder if for a very small fraction of those committed funds, we could, you know, rebuild the inner curb, curb of the track, uh, fix the, the substrate, the material that it's on. I mean, it was a, as a, as an athletic structure, it was remarkably resilient in the flood. It's all still there as far as I can tell. Uh, and then to invest in some equipment for the track team, you know, to, a machine that can, or a device that can help us line the track so that we can hold competitions there. Hurdles, um, equipment like, uh, you know, a, a better runway for the long jump. So much more minor uh, improvements that would, you know, if we had a, if we had an auditorium where the roof was falling in and most of the seats weren't safe to sit in, we probably wouldn't accept that. That doesn't necessarily mean we build a brand new auditorium unless we have the opportunity, but it might mean, hey, let's tend to those things. So if we if we look at the track in a in a okay, let's let's do what we can for now in the context that we're in, I still think that there is a bright, a bright way forward for that. And then that's a deferred dream as you know, as we renew or think more broadly about all of our athletic facilities. So if that's a if that helps, it certainly helps me to see that as a potential way forward. And I will uh, commit to writing to Matt Link and to uh, Libby with some specific ideas about what that might look like. So anyway, um, thank you. I'm, again, tremendously grateful for all the careful thinking you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Just one more call out to anybody in the room who would like to speak. Okay. I see James's iPhone online with the hand raised. Hey folks, Jim Eikenberry here, a Montpelier resident um, and uh, supporter of the track as everybody knows. I really wanna echo um, what Nathan just shared that I would even add to it is we have an unsafe facility and I think that we don't wanna have that from a track standpoint. Uh, we don't want that for our soccer fields. We don't want that for the theater. And uh, we, we can't safely hold track meets um, and we lack a lot of basic equipment. And so, as he said, I think we can take some of those funds and make improvements just so it's a safe facility where we can have practice and somebody's not gonna, you know, break the rankle at the long jump pit. 
Um, I don't think that's asking too much. Um, so I think that we should make efforts towards that and that that's not a $2 million project to get there. Um, so let's consider that. And um, the equity piece I also want to talk about is related to transportation. Um, I really appreciate what Libby shared. And um, I think that the board should think long and hard about, you know, taking um, transportation away because I do think that's going to uh, uh, disproportionately impact the folks that we don't want to be disproportionately impacting. And as somebody who is a low income kid in a rural school who was bused to a good suburban school, um, I feel like I can really relate to the Roxbury folks right now. And I also think that there'd be a disproportionate impact to them if you took away some of the after school busing, whether it's for the current after school program locally in Roxbury or for the folks that are in middle and high school and need to take a bus to get back to uh, Roxbury. Um, I think those students deserve to participate in theater and after school programs and sports, just like the Montpelier kids too. Um, so again, thanks for all your hard work and efforts on this and uh, appreciate your, your work. Thank you, Jim. I see, I believe it's Benjamin with your hand raised. Go ahead and come on, on mic and please introduce yourself for the record. <laughs> Hi, um, can you hear me? Thank you. My name is Ben Pincus, and I'm calling from Roxbury, Vermont. And um, I just wanted to briefly say, you know, I want to thank again all of you guys for uh, working really hard and trying to get through really difficult decisions. Um, I do want to say that, of course, it's ironic that um, Act 127 is supposed to improve student equity. Um, the, the irony is there, of course, if it uh, negatively affects a struggling school like Roxbury, even potentially leading to its leading to its closure, um, is a huge irony. But beyond that, there's also other kinds of inequity at work. In particular, the sense of a real lack of power and agency on the part of myself, and I think many many other citizens and parents in in Roxbury, um, in which we feel like we have very little. Um, bit of a voice or say in this process. So I guess I'm just pleading to all of you guys, I know you're doing your best to make these difficult decisions, but I'm pleading that there's will be transparency going forward, um, that we, that Roxbury residents and parents are engaged in this process. Um, timelines are really important because we need time to plan for <clears throat> the future of our town. And there's so much uncertainty. And, um, you know, and just, I, I know that um, basically that's it. I just want to say that we need to know that there's going to be transparency and that we can be engaged in a process so we could have town planning and with the potential that our school will be closing in the future. Um, and anyway, thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Welcome. Is there anyone else who would be interested in making public comment? Okay. Well, the thinking so far out there is um, just to reiterate it: four hundred thousand dollars to get to get us as close as possible to a eight hundred thousand dollars of cuts. Four hundred thousand of that coming from um, salaries and benefits. 35,000 of that 35,000 of that coming from school-based budgets, 200,000 of that being additional draw on the reserve fund, and 100,000 of that coming from the facilities line of the budget. Can I ask a really quick but the school-based budgets, what is the total amount of school-based budgets? So we're not we're not oh, saying well, all school-based budgets are going to be cut and we're going to save 35,000. We're saying of the 100 and... We would divvy it up per school. We'd mm -hmm. say like 10,000 per Montpelier schools and 5,000 per Roxbury mm -hmm. So schools. it's a reduction in the school-based budget. Yes. It's not an elimination of school-based oh, Okay. No. <laughs> so we're not getting we're rid of... Exactly. We're not, yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, we're not getting rid of... I just want to be clear. So for yeah. instance, what we anything. could say 
and this is just an example of what's in the school-based budget, right? One example, one principal gave to me today, because I said, give me, I know they're going to ask for examples. So give me some examples of where you would think about this. Yes. Um, one principal said to me today, well, some of our field trips are pretty far away from school and they cost a lot of money to do that. Maybe we say, no, you have to do it within a certain radius of the school system to keep it within you know, the X amount of dollars. Um, and so I can cut some of that money that's dedicated to field trips in that way. Um, another principal said, well, our classroom teachers get this amount of money. I could cut that by a couple hundred dollars and easily get $10,000, right? Like, in, and the, what the district has provided to um, those types of lines, like supplies and things are, is very generous over the years. So, um, so there are places that can be, found. Um, but that, again, is a principal's decision that principals run those. I don't run those. So I would trust that the principals would be um, working with their colleagues inside their school to, yep. to figure that piece out. Thank you. But those were examples that were given to me today. Okay. And were you asking, Scott, let's just, we just pick a school $10,000 from the Main Street Middle School school-based budget is... Ten thousand of a hundred thousand dollars, ten thousand of fifty thousand dollars. Just and I'm just I'm not saying you have to tell us exactly what Main Street Middle School's school based budget is, but just roughly. I'm just trying to think. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Right okay that's okay okay i think i think the take the idea, yeah the yeah. take home is we're not cutting all field trips we're no, just no no no, yes. no nor no. all school yeah. supplies like there's still going to be money for pencils and field trips and we have to recycle teachers were we're thinking about new textbooks um maybe this isn't the year that we buy the new textbooks no. right like so there's those yep. were the examples that were given to me today by principals, mm -hmm. but it was not eliminate field i don't want that yes. message getting I, out there that's why not, I to, thank you for asking yes. it then so it's not eliminate field trips. It's more of, okay, you, have, more you have this amount of money for field trips. So you need to really be careful about mm -hmm. where you decide to go Thank because you. this is what you have. And you have this amount of money for your classroom budget. So you have to make sure all the caps get back on the markers. Exactly. <laughs> Pencil recycling program. <laughs> I see Miriam has her thing. I think they tried that. <laughs> so, oh, I got an example. So sorry, Miriam, hold on one second. Uh, like a school-based, one of our school-based budgets is $215,000. Okay. Another school-based budget is four four hundred fifty oh. plus. So we're talking about $10,000 from yes. four hundred. Yeah. yeah. You, yes. Another one is $234,000. It's almost yeah. like we're in the future where you're reading that off your book. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, but Miriam. Okay, um, would the appropriate time to talk about smaller renovations to the track be next week? Yes. Yeah. Right. Cool. Or or maybe even after we land the budget. But yeah. Okay. Thank you for <laughs> I'm sure Nathan would love to hear what you're thinking about <laughs> too. I just want to make sure we have that conversation at yep. some point. Yep. You betcha. You betcha. Um any other comments on this? current direction that the board is giving to Libby or questions. I would just like to thank the board for a very thoughtful process and really good conversation, but it's not easy to have. So thank you. Not every board can do that. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Here, here. And more to come. And <laughs> more about to come to full. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, that brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is um, policy monitoring. Uh, we have two policies up for monitoring today, the board superintendent relationship, uh, which is A24, and class size, which is D6. So I have a motion to approve those monitoring reports. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion or questions? I have a couple of questions on the class size. It looks like our policy is a required policy. Yes. Does that mean it's the kind where the AOE wrote it and we adopted it? No. No. So it's required that we have it, but we came up with yes the language. Do you I will tell you there are several boards of districts who are disadvantaged by 127 who are rewriting their class size policy. 
so that they can have bigger classrooms yes. and fewer teachers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we are not doing that. We are not doing that. I just wanted to, yeah. as, as evidence of you can change the we can change this. policy. It's a mandatory that we have one, but it's not yeah. a written one by like lawyers. Yeah. And this might be something, I don't know if Jim is on the plane by now. No, I still see him. That he could answer because he's been on the policy committee or maybe you, Libby, can. I'm curious to know, and it's okay if we don't answer this exactly tonight, but um, where the numbers in our policy came from, if they're like rooted in some yeah, kind of best know. practice research or I see in our policy, it says recommendations by the AOE is one of the factors we considered, but I just wasn't sure. How, basically how we came up with those numbers exactly. I do not know how yeah. the numbers were, were created. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, Jim. I, I don't either. And and they predate my, um, they, pre, they predate even me. Um, oh, I thought yes. this was 2018 policy. Okay. It, it was, but we basically carried over the numbers from previous gotcha. policy. Gotcha. Uh, I think it had something to do with what, at some point teachers kind of felt was the like the, the sweet spot zone of manageability for a class where you have you know not too many students where for whatever age group it becomes a management problem and you're not really able to give individual attention but also not Certainly. so small that there's not you know the opportunity for class interaction and and good social dynamics that's my recollection okay yeah and i'm certainly not at all tonight or maybe even ever advocating for changing the policy. I um, was just curious. I'm, I'm sure there is science out there that tell us what optimal class sizes are. And anyway, wasn't sure if we had it rooted in that. And then um, why don't the class sizes apply to specials at the Main Street, at Main Street Middle School? Do you know? It's not part of our policy. It's just, I think that the, I, the way I read the policy, it's really focusing on core content. I see. Which wouldn't be a specials wouldn't be Got considered it. it. Although it is something that, particularly at the high school, when there's so many, you know, Latin fours out there, uh, <laughs> what that what that class size would look like. And I'm just picking on Joe and the audience, but um, it's certainly I think it's something that they discuss at the high school level when kids choose classes. Got of, it. Can this class run or not? Or how is this class going to run with a small number of kids? Mm -hmm. Or can it run differently? Is my understanding of it, but Joe can correct me if I'm wrong. All right. All right. Thanks. Any other questions or discussion? I just, is there most with policy monitoring reports at the end, you report compliance? Oh, yeah. And so Thank you. I guess, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. It's and not? so. Oh, it got cut off. That's all. I got cut off in the okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. So we're all waiting to know, Libby. Are we in compliance? We are in compliance with our okay. class size policy. I oh, forgot I about that. It. Thank you. No? Signature at the top? No, there's usually at the bottom. At See the how bottom, it goes all the way down? Or... It goes all, all the way right. down to the bottom of the page. My hunch is, is that that was there's on like... the back of the page. <laughs> and I and it okay. scanned in just the front of the page. I comply with the numbers. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other discussion or questions? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, I think the next item on our agenda is to adjourn. I'll entertain a motion. I move we adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> I mean, my, my plan doesn't take off till 10, so. Um, <laughs> he, he, was ready. Ready. he was ready for a long board. Right. Yeah. So we can keep going. Yeah, yeah. Ready to hang out, my, my yeah I've, I've got nothing better to do for the next <laughs> hour. Jim, go get a good book. Yeah. <laughs>